Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, the world's most exciting podcast, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, New York Times best-selling author and National Radio Hall of Fame inductee, Michael Savage. It is The Savage Nation. Bernie Sanders is a con man from the get-go, and I've told you that. I know the type. I ran from New York to get away from the Bernie Sanders types. They're the worst sort, the worst type in every people, there's a worse type. He's the worst type of my people. But having said that, millions of people are gulled by him. Millions of people are deceived by him. And so I have to spend some time to try to elucidate who this man actually is. It's been said that socialism enters through a ballot, while communism enters through a bullet. But make no mistake about it, while the nice old Seltzer man from New York looks like a nice old Seltzer man from New York, who only wants fairness and clean water, and uh, everyone should be happy. That's not what he wants. What he wants is absolute power and a totalitarian way of life. He wants communism. If you look at socialism and communism, the twin sisters of evil, you will find that they're one and the same. One is the more peaceful approach, the other is the more violent approach. And wherever communism has appeared, millions of people have died. But what does democratic socialism really mean? Many of you are children and uh, naive, and you really think there's a thing called democratic socialism. It, there's no such thing. Either it's socialism or it's not socialism. It's like it's either cancer or not cancer. Now, there are varieties of cancer, and there are stages of cancer. Let's put it to you that way. As you well know, there's stages one, two, three, and four in cancer. Maybe there are others. I'm not an oncologist. Bernie Sanders is a stage two cancer on the uh, political uh, landscape. He is a clear Bolshevik. Now, what is a Bolshevik? Go back to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 in Russia, and you see that Bolshevik means a member, a person who was a Bolshevik, was a member of the majority faction of the Russian Social Democratic Party. Listen to those words, the Russian Social Democratic Party, which renamed itself the Communist Party after seizing power in the October Revolution of 1917. So you say, well, why am I getting so worked up over him? Look, first of all, he got more votes the last time around in New, in New Hampshire. I call it New Hampshire because that's part of the reason he's popular there. It is in many ways one of the drug uh, uh, locus I said one of the locuses of a drug addiction in America is New Hampshire. Everyone knows that. There's a terrible opioid crisis in New Hampshire because there's a lot of poverty in New Hampshire. And poverty breeds desperation. Poverty breeds anger. Poverty breeds desperation in the voter who thinks that somebody screwed him that his downtrodden lifestyle is a result of somebody else. And then into that enters a demagogue like the old Seltzer man, uh, Bernie Sanders. So I told you what the Bolsheviks are uh, in, uh, in Russia. And um, if you look at the Bolshevik Revolution, I want to go back to the beginning. It was founded by uh, Vladimir Lenin. You may have heard his name and Alexander Bogdanov. And they split from the more liberal Menshevik faction of the Marxist Russian Social Democrat Labor Party, which was a revolutionary socialist political party formed in 1898 at its second party congress in 1903. What happened then? After forming their own party in 1912, the Bolsheviks took power in Russia in November 1917. Listen to this next line. Overthrowing the liberal provisional government of Kerensky and became the only ruling party in the subsequent Soviet Russia and its successor regime, the Soviet Union. They considered themselves the leaders of the revolutionary working class of Russia, and their beliefs and practices were often referred to as Bolshevism. You should study Kerensky, the liberal provisional government that was running Russia before the Bolsheviks took power and you could see what could happen in any country. 
Now, you may say it can't happen here. People are too fat and happy. You may be right. It can't happen here now. But the demographic shift in America, which is why Obama flooded America with third world dummies, is to make sure it could happen here. You must understand that Obama, like Sanders, is a lifetime revolutionary socialist slash communist. The only thing that's changed is that both of them become uh, wealthy. Sanders on a minor scale and Obama on a major scale. And uh, now that things have changed, you don't hear Obama screaming for the revolution anymore, do you? Now that he has the $100 million book deal, the $100 million Netflix deal, now that he, uh, has, he had three mansions before he left office, no one asked any questions. Where was Jake Tapper then? Who's behind was he licking at that time? Pardon me, Jake. You, you know, it's because of guys like Jake Tapper that a bum like Bernie Sanders could get this far. It's because of guys like Wolf Blitzer that Obama could get away with virtual murder during eight years of a terror tactic in this nation. So here we are. You say, well, it can't happen here. Trump's going to win by a landslide. We hope so. But let's say Trump wins by a landslide. It's a long time from now. Remember that. But let's say that happens and Trump is healthy for those years. I hope he is with the diet he's eating. I don't know, man. So let's say he... He lives out the whole next term, God willing. And we have a prosperous eight years and relative world peace. What happens then? He can't run again. What happens then is the millions of illegal aliens and tens of millions of disaffected, youthful, brainwashed Americans are seething under the surface, waiting for the revolution. And on top of them, Sanders will be gone by then. He's not, a, he's not going to be around that much longer. There's no way a man could have a heart attack and two stents and keep up what he's doing for very long. No way. I'm sorry. It would, de it would defy, by the way, all medical knowledge for a man of his age, of his weak stature, his weak genetics, and to have had a heart attack and go on like he goes on, barnstorming through America, waving his arms and screaming with such hatred, and to live much longer. It's almost impossible to perceive. Incidentally, he, be, he may be the first if he does. But uh, underneath him, beneath him, is a girl he trained while she was still working for his campaign. That girl is a stone-hearted racist. That girl hates white people. That girl thinks her race is superior to all those on the planet. And her name is Occasional Cortex. That, my friends, is what makes up for the Red Brigades. That, my friends, is what the Khmer Rouge was made up of. If you want to study what occasional cortex will do to this country, look no further uh, than the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. That is who she is. Now, we have a small version of a Soviet government already operational in America. It came to life during the Kennedy administration. It flowered during the Johnson administration. It flowered greatly during the civil rights movement, and I'll give you all of the lineage of all of this. And uh, you will see that we have the tentacles of a Soviet system already in place in this government. Now, I could throw the name Trump out right now because you could say he was the antithesis to this growing octopus of socialism, and he was, which is why the deep state has and is still trying to destroy him. You must understand that over a 50-year period, a government becomes very entrenched in all aspects of itself. And all aspects of itself reflect the socialism of this government that has been here for a long time. And they didn't want an outsider to come along. They didn't want a businessman. They wanted a politician from a party who was a well-known factor who could be controlled. And along comes this brash, New York businessman, Donald Trump, who was a naked capitalist and a rogue to them, and they don't know what to do with him. So they try to smear him for years. It blows up in their face. Then they get their stooge henchmen, Pelosi, Schiff, and the other characters uh, who still try to destroy him because they do want the very same uh, tentacles to have their continuous grip upon America. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many aspects of the Trump administration that are big government. You think I'm naive? You're mistaken. 
the budget is out of control. It's very much like a socialist government in terms of the budget. I remember I criticized Bush in the second term or the second half of his administration. And I said, wait a minute now. This, gov- this government under, under Bush is very much like a, a socialist government with the crazy spending. But what Bush did in spending is, is child's play compared to what uh, Trump's administration is doing. They're spending like crazy. Now, I know we don't care. Because compared to the other side, we're better off, blah, blah, blah. I've heard it all, and we are. I know we are. Obviously, when you look at the other side, anything is better than the other side. But on the other hand, if the man is a fiscal conservative, he's got to start being fiscally conservative. So, again, let's get back to what I'm talking about. Bernie the Bolshevik takes New Hampshire. Hampshire. Now, he wins with 151,000 votes. In the past, he won uh, 70,000. Last, uh, last night, he won by 70,000. Four years ago, the communists won by 150,000. It's true there were more people in the, uh, in the race last night, so it's a very hard analysis to make. And where did this socialism begin? It began in the early 19th century with utopian communities such as the Shakers and the activist visionary Josiah Warren and intentional communities inspired by Charles Fourier. And then in 1877, labor activists. Labor activists, and I'm talking about now in America, immigrants basically from British, German, or Jewish backgrounds founded the Socialist Labor Party in 1877. 1901, the Socialist Party is founded in America. On the Socialist Party of America, presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs uh, led a great opposition to World War I and led the government into a repression collectively known as the First Red Scare. Now, pay attention to the first socialist presidential candidate, Eugene V. Debs. In the 20s, the Socialist Party declines, but they ran Norman Thomas for president six times in the 20s and 30s. You may remember the name Norman Thomas, right? In the 30s, suddenly the Communist Party USA takes importance in labor and racial struggles. And it suffers a schism which converged in the Trotskyist Socialist Workers Party. It's interesting to me that I think that's where Sanders comes in. He's sort of a Trotskyite, by the way. In the 50s, McCarthy comes along. And with UAC and investigations of Hollywood, academia, and government, socialism runs and hides under the rocks. In the 60s, now remember the 60s, you had a lot of radicalization in America brought about by the new left and other social struggles and revolts. And uh, Michael Harrington, another name to remember, and other socialists were actually called to work for the Kennedy administration and then the Johnson administration's so-called war on poverty and so-called great society. And socialists at that time also were drawn into and played key roles in the civil rights movement. Now, the 70s come along, and you have revolutionary situations in America characterized by black power, allegedly in opposition to the Vietnam War, and you have groups like the Weather Underground uh, appearing, which conduct a campaign of bombings and killings. In San Francisco, we now have a DA whose mother was a member of the Weather Underground to show you how far they have come. Pay, pay attention to the moving parts here. George Soros is funding all of these weather underground types in DA races across America. Remember the head of the snake, the ACLU. Remember the other head of the other serpent, George Soros, funding groups like these. 1982, the Democratic Socialist of America is formed after a merger between the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee and the New American Movement. And then suddenly in the 80s, anarchists become visible uh, as a result of their activities. And so now we move up to 08. The DSA, what's the DSA? The Democratic Socialists of America. There was a party, there is a party. Supports who? Barack Obama. Did you know this? Bernie Sanders is the new candidate of the Democratic Socialists of America. He has revived the lineage 
of this toxic socialist movement and has brought it into the mainstream in this presidential election. And now you know the rest of the story. I'll be right back. The Savage Nation. It's Savage On Demand. We are accused of having communists and communist sympathizers in our employ. Undoubtedly, there are such persons in Hollywood, as you will find elsewhere in America. But we neither shield nor defend them. We want them exposed. We're not responsible for the political or economic ideas of any individual. But we are responsible for what goes on the screen. We guard that with great care. If communists have attempted to inject their propaganda into the motion picture, they have failed miserably. We will never permit them to succeed. Well, that was then, this is now, that was 1947. The Reds have succeeded beyond their wildest imagination. All of Hollywood is given towards Marxism in one way or another, socialism, anarchism, Most of them are hardcore Trotskyites and don't even know it. They're stooges, they're puppets, they're fools, they're tools. And we're talking about the victory of the naked Bolshevik in the primary in New Hampshire. Bernie the Bolshevik takes New Hampshire. I call it Hampshire for a good reason. Now you say, eh, it's not like that, and he's not really a communist. He's just a Democrat socialist, and he's not that frightening. That's because you don't know the history of communism. You don't want to spend the time to study the differentials between so-called democratic socialism and hardcore Trotskyism, but uh, you can study it. I gave a wonderful monologue on the subject and traced the uh, lineage and history of Bernie Sanders all the way back to the beginning of the utopian communities in the early 19th century, such as the Shakers, and brought you all the way up to Barack Obama, who was backed by the Democratic Socialists of America in 08. And Bernie Sanders, who has been credited with reviving the American socialist movement by bringing it into the mainstream public view for the 2020 United States presidential election. Michael Savage, a host like no other. Health experts issued an ominous warning about a coronavirus pandemic three months ago. And in their simulation, they showed it could kill 65 million people. Now, I don't want to be accused of being an alarmist, but how about being a realist? Where is the difference between realism and alarmism? Can you tell me? Should I sit here and make believe this isn't the problem? Borders, porous borders. Drugs are flowing in at a record rate. Illegal aliens racing across the border at a rate I've never seen anything like this. How many have come in from China since this started who were infected, who passed the so-called screening of the Schmendricks at the airport? Screening. You don't show symptoms for 10 days. How many of them are working in restaurants right now? You don't know, huh? Oh, I'm not allowed to ask the question? Go to hell, I'm not allowed to ask the question. I'll ask any damn question I want. Now, I'm going to go back to the basics here. I'm going to go back to the beginnings of epidemiology. Don't worry, it's not a big word. It's the history of science of epidemics. It began with an evil white male a doctor named John Snow, somebody that occasional cortex ought to read about the next time she wants to put down white people, that dumb idiot. Now, why am I mentioning epidemiology and cholera and John Snow? Because it's a valuable lesson for today. London, 1854, Soho, England, people and animals living in cramped and dirty quarters. Deadly outbreak of cholera is spreading. Doctors and scientists in those years believe it's caused by a miasma or bad air. Sound familiar? It sounds like Jerry Nadler. They theorize that particles from rotting matter and waste are getting into the air and making people sick with uh, this disease. Who comes into the picture now? Jon Snow, very well-known physician. He figures out that something other than the air might be responsible for the cholera epidemic. And so what does he do? He carefully maps the outbreak, and he finds that everyone who has been affected by this illness has something in common, a single connection in common. And what is it? They have all pump water for the local Broad Street pump. So on September 8th, 1854, the father of epidemiology, Dr. John Snow, 
tests his theory by removing the pump's handle, and he effectively stops the outbreak, proving his theory and opening a door to modern epidemiology. John Snow was the first to use maps and records to track the spread of a disease back to its source. And today, these ideas provide the foundation for how we're supposed to find and stop diseases all over the world. We have far better tools than he did to identify and track illness, labs, computer systems, in-depth knowledge of germs. But when you have political detectives in the CDC who have thrown away their scientific training at the NIH and the CDC, what good are all of the tools? What good are all the tools in the world if they're looking over their shoulder at political implications? So what am I saying? Living in a world where disease can spread around the globe very quickly, what's the most logical thing that you do? You don't need a PhD in epi epidemiology to know what to do. You need common sense. Common sense is you stop travel from China, and that's the end of the story. They themselves have introduced the quarantine, but not here. After all, how are we going to get the fentanyl into this country if you put in a quarantine? I mean, you got to have that fentanyl flowing, don't you? Do you understand what I'm saying to you, that there are 40 million Chinese quarantined? There's a case in Chicago, 22 states are on alert. Europe is now seeing cases, and we're doing nothing but listening to these, these imbeciles at the CDC who are doing zero. Are you listening to me? Are you hearing me? A nurse is saying the quarantine is failing. A video has come out showing dead bodies in the halls of hospitals. It's not just hitting the young and the old. Young men are among the victims. Now, again, again, I'm not here to alarm you. I'm here to awaken you because there are things you can do. Some things are commonsensical here in America. Very commonsensical. I mean, I have to spell it out for you what not to do. And what to do? Your mother was right in a certain way. Avoid crowds. Your mother knew enough to stay away from people who were sick, right? And when flu season approached, or when you were feeling a little under the weather, she told you to do certain things that promoted healing. That was good mother's advice. And I then looked into that, and we all know that no medications currently exist on the market that can stop a viral infection, no matter what the quacks tell you. There are no drugs that can stop a viral infection. Now, there are some antiviral drugs, but they're not recommended in these cases as a preventive. They don't work. You understand? These antiviral drugs may be useful in treating serious diseases such as Ebola, but they're definitely of no use to prevent the viral infection. Your best defense, ladies and gentlemen of the Savage Nation, is a strong offense. And what does that mean? One, boost your immune system to lower your susceptibility to infection and disease. You see, if everyone could get the disease, they would get the disease. But everyone on earth is not going to get the disease. Some will have a powerful immune system, uh, an, an immune system powerful enough to fight off the virus should they even contract it. There are known techniques for boosting your immunity. And any qualified medical doctor will tell you that. A good doctor will recommend a uh, diet with immune-enhancing uh, foods, regular exercise, and sleep. You've heard it all. I've done a whole show on epidemiology, a podcast, which you can probably find from last January. And you know what the number one factor in a strong immune system is? Sleep. Would you believe that? Rest. The body needs to restore itself. Without it almost, no matter, no matter what else you do, your body's going to break down. But there's much more to do. You can boost your immune system to maximum levels without using drugs. Now, a couple of years ago, I published a small pamphlet on Kindle called Diseases Without Borders. And I did it because there was EBV 68 coming in because of Obama. Remember that epidemic, the polio-like illness that Obama brought into this country because he was bringing the children who were infected from Honduras? And remember this. This EBV 68, EDV 68 virus is endemic in Honduras. The children were coming in by the train loads under Obama. These open borders maniacs are going to kill all of us. So I was trying to get people to do what they could to uh, enhance their immune system. It's a Kindle edition. It's not for the money. 
I was trying to help people fortify supercharging their immune system against viral infection. And it's not about the money. It's about the wisdom and importance of the knowledge that I have that I'm trying to share with you. And if you want to be cynical and say, bah, humbug, you know it all, God bless you. I wrote about epidemics from EVD-68 and measles tuberculosis. The same rules still apply. The same rules still apply. Many agree with me. And now we have an illness and people are sitting there saying there's nothing I can do. Well, there's many things you can do. The most important thing is we should be in imposing a travel ban right now. There should be an immediate travel ban to and from China. But the money at stake, the politics at stake is so great right now that I think they'd rather see 65 million people wiped out than slow the, uh, the flow of money. This time I'm petrified. Virologist who helped discover SARS offers chilling take on coronavirus outbreak. He says, this time I'm petrified. And uh, now they're comparing it to the 0203 outbreak of SARS that killed over 800 people. People are saying, well, we survived SARS, so we'll survive this, right? No. According to an article in Zero Hedge, one of the virologists who discovered SARS, which, by the way, also originated from a coronavirus in China, paints a different tale of this latest outbreak. And uh, the virologist, Guan Yi, of the University of Hong Kong State Key Lab of Emerging Infectious Diseases, visited Wuhan. He says that he didn't see nearly enough being done to fight off the new epidemic. He said that due to the New York people were out at markets without masks and without any sense of the epidemic. He said that airports were not being disinfected. He said the local governments weren't even handling our out-quarantine guides to people who were leaving the city. So where it's going to go, we don't know yet. Now, I want to then go back to another epidemic, which you may have heard of. We all learned about it in high school. It was called the Spanish flu. It used to be a thing called the Asian flu. But with the introduction of political insanity, the same political insanity uh, that is now eliminating art history at Yale University because it's too white, not because it's too great, but it's too white. They've got to introduce aboriginal garbage now at Yale University and compare it to that of uh, Da Vinci. You hear? This is what's going on in the country now because of the psychotics who are running everything. But the psychotics are not limited to government. They're not limited to academia. They're not limited to medicine. The psychotics are everywhere. That's a bigger epidemic. There was a thing called the Spanish flu of 1918. 500 million people were infected with the Spanish flu virus. 50 million died. That's when the world population, U.S. population, I'm sorry, the world population was 1.5 billion. One third of the earth, of the people on the earth were infected, all the way out to the Pacific Islands. 500 million people were infected, 50 million died. Do you know how many people that is proportion the population, right? So what happened to end it? Did some genius doctor come along with a vaccine, a serum? No. Something we all learned in epidemiology back in the early days when it was still being taught as a science before they had to look over their shoulders and see if they were offending the Spaniards or the Asians or anyone else by renaming diseases. Something we all learned was that epidemics burn themselves out. It's about the only thing you can do is let it burn itself out. Maybe it's God's little joke on all of humanity when we thought we had it all under control. You know, if you're religious oriented, you know, you know, well, okay. Mankind thought he would just keep rolling along with a booming stock market and with all his modern technology, nothing could affect man anymore. But how did the Spanish flu end? It burnt itself out. A second wave uh, of the virus struck in late 1918. And what happened? It almost died out. And why? How did that happen? How did it just suddenly die out? A theory holds that the 1918 virus mutated extremely rapidly to a less lethal strain. Folks, this is a common occurrence with influenza viruses. There is a tendency amongst them for pathogenic viruses to become less lethal with time. Why? Because the people that they infected tend to die off. Do you understand that? As the hosts, meaning the people, of the more dangerous strains die from the disease, the virus needs to keep growing, and a less, a less lethal strain or less lethal strains tend to mutate. 
That is our only hope. And also, obviously, common sense. The Savage Nation. It's savage, uncut, unfiltered, and raw. Here you've got a corrupt party, unlike any in the history of the world, the Democrats, with it stinks to high heaven. They don't want anything about Hunter Biden to come out. Everyone knows how corrupt that story is. But it goes way beyond Elizabeth Warren's corruption. Bernie Sanders steering money from his campaign to his wife. It's unbelievable to me. Now, at the same time the corruption is going on, the Chinese virus epidemic is raging out of control in China, spreading like crazy, mainly, of course, in Asia right now, but it's not going to limit itself to that. It's now uh, on an alert in 22 states, but not one word from the CDC other than, uh, let's see, wash your hands. All of the smart boys with expensive shirts and ties at the CDC can tell you is to wash your hands. So the corruption is epidemic. Medicine has been corrupted. Science has been corrupted. You've got a moron, a young child from Sweden who has no education whatsoever, who's now put on par with the leading economists of the world. Why? Because of Jake Tapper. If you have people with the idiocy of Jake Tapper and Wolf Blitzer and that type in the media, then you see a party of corruption. Then you could see a child with no education whatsoever talking about science and held on the same level as a scientist. Or a moron like uh, occasional cortex talking about economics, saying everything should be cooperative. In other words, they should... Did you read what she said the other day? She said that Bezos made his billions, but he didn't make them. The people who make the stuff for him made the company. In other words, the workers in the factories, you know the old communist line, workers of the world unite, and that the only way to save the world, that moron says, is to turn Amazon into a cooperative. This is why... I say to you, we're way beyond just fake news. It's fake science. It's fake art history. Yale just uh, announced that they're dropping uh, art history at Yale because it's too uh, too white. Yeah, Italian Renaissance art. I just got a report of another university where a genuine expert on Italian Renaissance art is now being forced to teach pre-Columbian art in order to please the Hispanics in his audience. Now, I happen to like pre-Columbian art. I have a piece of it right on my desk. See, Jim, right here? I have this guy's face on my desk all the time. I like uh, ancient art of all kinds, prehistoric. Columbian is interesting to me, but it's nowhere near the magnitude of creative genius of that of the Europeans. It doesn't come near it. It's beautiful in its own way. But that's like comparing, uh, I don't know, uh, hybridizing corn in a primitive manner to what's being done in a laboratory today. It doesn't really compare. It's brilliant in its own way. But why would you throw out European art unless you just want to appease the audience of those who can't even keep up with it? Anyway, so you've got dumb people in America now, which is how the media works with dumb people. And the more dumb, the better for the media. The lower the IQ the higher the fake news quotient, FNQ. I want to talk about the Chinese virus epidemic because I think it's an important story that's not going to go away too soon. It's not disappearing tomorrow. And you say, well, am I panicking you? Yeah, maybe I'm panicking you. This time a petrified virologist who helped discover SARS offers chilling take on coronavirus outbreak. Everyone will get infected, says a nurse at the Corpse Strewn Hospital, says quarantine is failing. China built a lab, did you know this, to study SARS and Ebola in Wuhan, Wuhan, which is the epicenter of this uh, viral outbreak. They built a lab to study SARS and Ebola in Wuhan, and U.S. biosafety experts warned back in 2017 that a virus could escape the facility that has become key in fighting the outbreak. So it may not be... uh, it may not be zoonata coming from a, a bat in a soup. It could be that it escaped the laboratory. Health experts issued an ominous warning about a coronavirus pandemic not three months ago. And they did a simulation. It showed that it could kill 65 million people. Are you listening to this? The Westwood One Podcast Network. 
Warning, The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, the world's most exciting podcast, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, New York Times best-selling author and National Radio Hall of Fame inductee, Michael Savage. It is imperative that City Hall send a message that we have zero tolerance for blatant corruption. This is especially infuriating to me as someone who represents a district that has long suffered from filthy streets. Residents in my district have to step out and dodge feces, trash, and needles every single day. This is a terrible, unacceptable public health crisis, and no one should live in those conditions. But time and time again, when we ask Director Nuru to take action, to add bathrooms and trash cans and pressure washing, the answer was no. This is Michael Savage. I live in ground zero for public corruption. As I have told you, there is no newspaper in this city. I have told you the city I live in in San Francisco, there is no oversight. There's no two-party system. They have totally corrupted the entire meaning of the political process. Nancy Pelosi is at the top of the pyramid along with uh, Dianne Feinstein. And then it goes all the way downhill. Right away, you understand what I'm talking about. You'll put two and two together. How many years have I been telling you that San Francisco is the most corrupt city in the country? Well, what do I mean by that? How do I know that? How? When you see people crapping in the streets and they're not arrested because the police have had uh, their uh, rules. The rules are you can't stop a man from defecating in front of a restaurant window because it's his civil rights to crap in front of a restaurant. If that's not an example of a degenerated, corrupt city, tell me what is. Then you see the homeless bums all over the streets aggressively uh, panhandling, aggressively attacking people and not being arrested. Then you see the roads are broken. You have an iconic structure like the Golden Gate Bridge, perhaps one of the most iconic symbols in the world. The road's broken as it comes into San Francisco. Where do the hundreds of millions of dollars in road funds go, highway funds? Who's stealing it? I've asked this for 10 years. I know that we're focusing on a bigger picture. You know there may be a connection between what's going on with Donald Trump and why Pelosi decided to pull the trigger after saying she wouldn't. I want you to follow this logic, and I want you to understand it's pure speculation. Do you remember last year Pelosi said she would definitely, definitely not pursue impeachment because it would be too divisive, it would rip the nation apart? And then we were told she was pushed by occasional cortex and the far left. I didn't believe that for one minute. Pelosi is a, a force unto herself. So why would Pelosi have decided to pull the trigger on impeachment? Well, I don't really know, but I'm starting to get an inkling about something. Now, what am I referring to? There's a big case that's just come out of San Francisco where the public works director, Mohammed, Mohammed, Mohammed Nuru, and his buddy, a restaurant owner, Nick Bovis, were charged in a federal criminal complaint with wire fraud. Now, you say, well, what does this local story have to do with the federal story of impeachment? Well, first of all, you've got to understand something. This corruption case in San Francisco is a federal case. It was brought by the United States District Court for the Northern District of California by the U.S. Attorney David Anderson. This U.S. attorney was appointed by none other than Donald Trump. Are you starting to see how the pieces might be falling in place? On August 16th, 2018, President Trump nominated Anderson to be the U.S. attorney for the Northern District of California. I have to tell you, we've had no U.S. attorney here. They were always hacks of Barbara Boxer, hacks of Dianne Feinstein, hacks of Nancy Pelosi. They did nothing to stem the tide of corruption in this city and in the state. All of a sudden, we have a district attorney. And remember now, this is not going to be a locally adjudicated case. The communist who was just put in as the DA has nothing to do with this. This is a federal trial that Mohammed Nuru and Bovis are going to be facing. Something's wrong here. 
But I'll tell you right now, if I were writing the movie script and I've written three best-selling novels, here's how the movie script would go. It's pure fiction. A congresswoman goes after a president. The president tells her to back off. It's all crap. The congresswoman is so drunk on her own power, she won't let go. The president goes after her through an underling. You get the picture now? Because here's what I think could happen if I were writing a novel. This guy, Nuru, is going to sing. He's going to flip because they're going to throw the book at him. I'll read you the case in a few minutes because you're not going to believe how big this corruption case is. And you will see that this man is going to go away for 20 or 30 years, and he's an older man. He's 58. Or he's going to do a deal with the United States attorney, and that deal would incorpor incorporate blowing the whistle on who he's – uh, who else he thinks may be involved. Who was he involved with? Don't you think this money was flowing uphill for the last 20 years? Now, I have no proof of this. I'm only a fiction writer and a talk show host. It's only speculation on my part. But this, remember, is a federal case, not a local one. And it has the potential to bring down the entire House of Cards. And this may be why the entire Democrat structure, beginning here in Northern California, is doing everything it can to get Trump out of office right now. This is why they're impeaching him. What Trump has been doing in D.C. is causing waves to crash all over the nation in these corrupt cities. His U.S. attorney, along with his judges, will now be deciding that corruption on this level will no longer be tolerated. Remember, remember this is an easy case to follow. The U.S. attorney was appointed by Donald Trump just last year or two years ago. He's a new one, David Anderson. He's not from the boxer era, where he was just basically a house attorney. So we'll have to see where this goes. But what is the case? Tell me what the case is. No, I'm going to tell you what the case is. So what are the crimes allegedly, and I'm saying allegedly because they're innocent until proven guilty. What are the crimes that are alleged that Mohammed Nuru and James Bovis uh, committed. Well, according to the complaint, it has to do with cash and free travel in exchange for the commissioner's assistance to win a bid for the right to run a restaurant in the San Francisco airport. Now, do I have to tell you why everyone wants a store at an airport? Have you seen the prices? Have you seen that a beer costs $10? Have you seen what a bottle of water costs at these nightmarish restaurants at airports? Now you know why. U.S. Attorney Anderson says the complaint describes a web of corruption involving bribery, kickbacks, side deals by one of San Francisco's highest ranking city employees. They go on. Special agent in charge Bennett says government employees are entrusted and expected to protect the best interests of the American public with integrity. The FBI will continue to investigate and hold accountable any public official. Now, I'm going to jump cut right here to the actual complaint. I'm going to read it in an outline for you and save you the time. What are the facts establishing probable cause? The FBI was doing this case for quite a, a while now. They were wiring people. They were following people. Count one, honest services, wire fraud, aiding and abetting, U.S. Code 18, 1343, 1346, two. That's just legalese. But what are they alleging? So in, in the broad scheme... Here are the statements about corrupt intent. One, San Francisco airport scheme. But there's more to it than that. Two, multi-million dollar mixed use development scheme. That's kickbacks on developments. Three, Transbay Transit Center, another huge boondoggle. Now listen to this. Four, bathroom trailer scheme and homeless container shelter scheme. Five, vacation home scheme. Now, let's for a moment talk about the bathroom trailer scheme and homeless container shelter scheme. How many years have I, Michael Savage, told you that there are billions of dollars being made off the homeless crisis, not only in San Francisco, but in every city in America? Every corrupt city in America is cashing in, not only on the bum crisis, which they f keep it festering in order to keep getting people angry, so more money is thrown at it, more money flows up the hill, get it? It, it's also related, not in this case, to illegal aliens. 
who account for billions upon billions of dollars a year in uh, funds that flow uphill, flow uphill. Remember, flow uphill. Key words are flow uphill, flow uphill. So you've got mixed-use development scheme, airport restaurant scheme, Transbay Transit scheme, bathroom trailer scheme, homeless container scheme, and vacation home scheme. What is this about? Why should you care? Why? Because as sure as I'm sitting here, they've got these guys, Mohammed Nuru and Nick James Bovis, in a vice. And they're going to squeeze them in this vice as tightly as they can until one or both of them decides to cooperate with the government. And when one or both of them cooperates with the government, you'll see all hell break loose in this city, in this state, in this nation. Because as sure as I'm sitting here, what I know about corruption, and I have studied everything going back to the corrupt Tammany Hall days in New York, any small-time commissioner who's corrupt kicks up hill, which kick, kicks uphill, uphill, uphill. It all flows uphill, not downhill. And remember, I want you to recall, please, Pelosi originally said a year or so ago she would not pursue impeachment in the House because why? Boys and girls of the savage nation, it would rip the nation apart. It's too divisive. And yet all of a sudden, somehow about a year ago, Pelosi pulled the trigger on impeachment. I'm asking a question. Could it be related to the fact that she knew this case was uh, trickling in the background and that they were working in the background? Something was going, look, this is how politics work. It's called pressure on both sides. And since we don't have an opposition party in San Francisco or in the state of California, it's a one-party corrupt system, and we have no newspapers in the state of California, none whatsoever. They do no investigation of any Democrats. They're just echo chambers of the Democrat machine. Well, we have a U.S. attorney who works for who? President Trump. The U.S. attorney and the FBI have been investigating these characters for a while. These characters are innocent until proven guilty. But if you read the affidavit in support of the criminal complaint, I don't care if you're a Democrat, you'll be as outraged as the San Francisco supervisors are pretending to be. The Savage Nation. It's Savage On Demand. Now we know that it's the very time that the conditions on our streets worsened. Director Nuru is accused of spending his time lining his own pockets. This is infuriating. My constituents and residents across the city deserve government officials that are entirely yeah. focused on one thing, yeah, effective, yeah, yeah, yeah. transparent decision-making sure, and results sure. that solve problems and improve right. quality you, of you life. You know, th these guys are they, so full of crap. The, this is a San Francisco supervisor making believe he's shocked by the dirt and filth in the streets and all of a sudden shocked by the corruption and he's going to clean it all up. They are running scared, all of them. They're all running scared. So they say it's Director Nuru and restaurant owner Bovis who are in the vice right now, but they're scared that it's going to come back on them somehow. Now, this guy, Nuru, was the head of the Department of Public Works. The budget was $500 million a year. That's not small change. $500 million a year budget. So what was this all about? According to the complaint, Nuru used his official position to benefit a billionaire in China who was developing a large multi-million dollar mixed-use project in San Francisco in exchange for travel and lodging, high-end liquor, and other gifts and benefits. You know, when we say some politicians are like no better than hookers, you kind of get the picture here. A bottle of liquor and a, and, a, and a free trip. This is what they sell their lives for? If this is true, it's disgusting. Nuru attempting to use his position as the chair of, of TJPA to secure a desirable lease for Bovis in the Transbay Transit Center in exchange for benefits provided by Bovis. Nuru providing Bovis with inside information on city projects regarding portable bathroom trailers and small container-like housing units for use by the homeless. You hear this? So that Bovis could win contracts for those projects. Do you understand why I've been screaming about corruption in this city for 10 years? Why I've been screaming about the homeless crisis, which is created by these 
corrupt politicians in order to steer money to the homeless issue and then cash in on it themselves. Nuru obtaining free and discounted labor and construction equipment from contractors, says the complaint, to help him build a personal vacation home in Calusa County, California, while those contractors were also engaging in business with the city. You say, well, this is standard operating procedure. Well, it shouldn't be if it is. And if it's going on in other cities, it shouldn't. But notice which city just got hit with this federal complaint. San Francisco. Why this city? Was this the biggest sign of corruption in the country? Maybe. But it's also the place where Feinstein and Pelosi reside. It's the place where Governor Newsom resides. It's the place where there is no newspaper. It's the place where there is no Republican Party. It's the place where they took Pelham, one, two, three. They're so successful in their corruption that nobody could touch them, so they thought. My friends, the only reason this is happening is because Donald Trump is president. The only reason Pelosi and Feinstein are trying to remove Donald Trump is because he unleashed this firestorm on them. Now, it's not on them, as as you well know. It's not on Pelosi and Feinstein. They're not named. It's Nuru and Beavis. Well, Bovis. I don't know. Bovis. Pardon me. Nuru and Bovis. Bovis. Nuru and Bovis. Mohammed, Nuru, and Nick Bovis. Not Feinstein. Nothing to do with any of the politicians. Nothing at all. But I think that you could reasonably assume that if there's a corruption case on this level in San Francisco, uh, let us say the um, higher-ups would have had to know about it or they would have stopped it. Right or wrong? Well, why? We can't allege it and we can't surmise it. It wouldn't be fair. I'm not Media Matters. Media Matters accused me of something I didn't do and it was picked up by the vermin in the media as though it was a fact. The same way they're smearing others in the conservative media, the same way they smear the president. I've been facing these vermin for, for 25 years, funded by George Soros. This is a big case. Michael Savage, a host like no other. Metaphor, metaphors, symbolism. This whole thing with uh, Meghan Markle, the soapbox uh, queen, and uh, the fake war hero, Andrew, I don't even know his name. What's his name, the the guy with the red hair? Harry, 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 Harry. It's a symbol of the death of the West. It's the entire edifice of the West come crumbling down, you know, all fall down. If ever you wanted a metaphor, a better metaphor for the collapse of what, of the West as we know it, it would be these two characters. But then again, I get ahead of myself and behind myself, and I don't want to talk about it. Welcome to the Savage Nation. I got pissed off at Chris Wallace, who I've always despised, uh, for a number of reasons. I don't like his sneer primarily. The snotty, the snide, the sneer, the liberalism, the snake. So I tweeted this, Chris Wallace is a snake, a snide, shallow, hollow man, always trying to escape his father's legacy, which was not magnificent to begin with. A carbon copy of a carbon copy of a true investigative reporter. Now that's a good summary of snide Chris Wallace. As somebody said at least his father, uh, Mike Wallace, interviewed Aldous Huxley in 1958, and you have to see, well, we went and looked it up, and the, the wonderful team I have, they dug it up for me, the actual interview from 1958 of one of the great authors of all time, Aldous Huxley. You may know him from his novel, Brave New World. Maybe you know him from other novels. I was so enamored of his writing that I read every book he ever wrote and every article he ever wrote. I went to England, as a matter of fact, when I was still able to go there. And I went into some great library in London and I found magazine articles that Huxley had written on furniture, of all things, and on architecture. You know, when you fall in love with an author, you read everything they write. Do you know that or not? I did. And I came out actually in enjoying him more than ever. His brother was also a brilliant man. Julian Huxley was a biologist, brilliant family. But Huxley uh, predicted things about the time we are living in, in that 1958 interview by Mike Wallace. And in a strange way, it ties into what I was trying to talk about on civilization and its discontents. Post-Christendom and the return of paganism in the West It's an intellectually appealing article from a Catholic magazine, the National Catholic Register. 
and it discusses what's happened after Christianity was destroyed or cru- crucified. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Christianity is being crucified in the West by, by the left, as you know. And the, the first post-Christian generation has emerged in America. A majority of the so-called drug-addicted Generation Z, all Americans born between 1999 to 2015, rejects the idea of a religious identity. Okay? And as a result, not only do they not believe in God, they don't believe in themselves. They don't believe in the country. They don't believe in anything. And as a result of that, this alarming generation uh, has descended upon us, and it results from a long process that started in the 18th century and became dominant in the hippie 1960s. Long article, worth reading, and I have a real treat for me. I hope it's a treat for you. The guys put together a phenomenal couple of segments for us on Aldous Huxley predicting the world that we are living in. Now, again, it's not just braving the world with the alphas, betas, gammas, and deltas. We know who the deltas are. That would be occasional cortex. That would be Rashida Tlaib. That would be that group. These, those are the deltas out of Brave New World who think that they're the alphas, but they're lower than the, de- the, the betas, lower than the deltas. They're actually the gammas. And the gammas are the loudest in the crowd. And so here's what I promised you. Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, predicted the world we live in, drugs, brainwashing, tech fascism. And I want to go to the Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, where he predicted the world we live in. Many of you read Brave New World in high school or college and kind of dismissed it. Uh, I wouldn't be that dismissive. In 1958, Mike Wallace, who was the father of, uh, I called him Meatball, and the junior, Meatball Jr. is Chris Wallace, the snide, sneering one. But at least Wallace did occasionally a good show. He did. He was a good interviewer. And he interviewed Aldous Huxley in 58. And he asked Huxley, as you see it, who and what are the enemies of freedom here in the United States? In other words, he was, it was a leading question. Huxley didn't take the bait. And he said, I don't think you can say who in the United States. Uh, I don't think there are any sinister persons that are deliberately trying to rob people of their freedom, he said. But he said there are a number of technological devices which anybody who wishes to use can use to accelerate the process of giving of, of going away from freedom of imposing control. Here is Aldous Huxley in his own words in 1958 in H1. As you see it, who and what are the enemies of freedom here in the United States? Well, I don't think you can say who in the United States. I don't think there are any sinister persons deliberately trying to rob people of their freedom. But I do think, uh, first of all, that there are a number of impersonal forces which are pushing in the direction of less and less freedom. And I also think that there are a number of technological devices which anybody who wishes to use can use to accelerate this process of going away from freedom, of imposing control. Hmm. Was that ever, was that ever uh, correct? technological devices. So what was he talking about in 1958? Television, radio, but mainly television at that time. Remember, the computer wasn't really readily available to the average person. God only knows what he would have thought of children walking around with iPhones in their cribs, right? In H2, he talks about technology as it becomes more and more complicated. Let's hear that one. Well, another force which I think is very strongly operative in this country is the a force of what may be called over-organization. Uh, as technology becomes more and more complicated, it becomes necessary to have more and more elaborate uh, organizations, more hierarchical organizations. And incidentally, the advance of uh, technology has been accompanied by an advance in the science of organization. It's now possible to make organizations on a larger scale than was ever possible before. And so that you have more and more people living their lives out as subordinates in these hierarchical systems controlled by bureaucracies, either the bureaucracies of big business or the bureaucracies of big government. You hear this? Now, he refers in the next clip, this is Aldous Huxley in 1958, interviewed by Mike Wallace, about Hitler and how Hitler used uh, technology and terror to get where he was. Listen to H3. Well, there are certainly devices which can be used in this way. I mean, let us uh, take, uh, after all, a piece of very recent and very painful history is the 
propaganda used by Hitler, which was incredibly effective. I mean, that, what were Hitler's methods? Hitler used terror on the one kind, brute force on the one hand, but he also used a very efficient uh, form of, uh, of propaganda, which uh, uh, he was using every modern device at that time. He didn't have TV, but he had the, the radio, which he used to the fullest extent, mm -hmm. and was able to uh, impose his will on an immense mass of people. I mean, the Germans were a highly educated people. Mm. The Germans were a highly educated people. That, of course, is one of the great tragedies of civilization, which is that probably the most advanced civilization on the earth at the time, the the German people, and incredible music and art and science became the most terrible on the planet because they used advanced technology to kill people, especially in the, the killing machines of the death camps. Uh, it's amazing what happened in that country at that time. He then talks about the communist countries in a clip. Let's jump to H5, Robert, please. Listen to this one. Well, at present, the television, I think, is being used uh, quite harmlessly. It's being used, I think, uh, I would feel it's being used too much to distract everybody all the time. But, I mean, imagine, which must be the situation in all communist countries, where the television, where it exists, is always saying the same thing the whole time. It's always driving along. It's not creating a wide front of distraction. It's creating a one-pointed uh, drumming in of a single idea all the time. It's obviously an immensely powerful instrument. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, and CNN always saying the same thing the whole time without mentioning the T word? It's around the clock propaganda against the president of the United States. This is absolutely an example uh, of that. Now, what about pharmacology? Remember in the late 50s, the psychoactive chemicals that most of you are on today didn't exist. What drugs were women and men on? in the 50s. If a person was nervous or anxious, they probably took a type of Milltown or Librium called a meprobamate, which was very similar to the, the phenobarbital type of drugs. And many housewives were hooked on a meprobamate or Milltown and Librium, and they would down it with a glass of wine. They were stoned most of the time. Not many, quite a few. And you don't know that. But that was about it. Then there were the bennies being given out by um, uh, diet doctors in New Jersey and other places to the to the wives who felt they were uh, didn't look like Marilyn Monroe, uh, so they were hooked on on benzodrine and they were psychotic from that. But the kind of drugs that Americans are on today were not even conceptualized at that time. The SSRIs, for example, for good and for bad, for better or for worse, they can be life saving. Don't get me wrong, they can make people's lives tolerable where they're intolerable. But there's been a lot of homicides and suicides tied to these SSRIs as an unexpected side effect of constantly playing with the serotonin levels in a person's brain. So Huxley predicted the pharmacology that was coming in clip six. Listen to this. And I think it's quite on the cards that we may have drugs which will profoundly change uh, our mental state without doing us any harm. I mean, this is the, the pharmacological revolution which has taken place, that we have now powerful mind-changing drugs which, physiologically speaking, are almost costless. I mean, they are not like opium or like coca, uh, cocaine, which uh, do change the state of mind, but uh, leave terrible results physiologically and morally. Hmm. Did you hear that little piece about cocaine? That's 1958 now. In an interview by Mike Wallace, who was a phenomenal interviewer, incidentally. Let us see what he says in number seven about drugs. I want to hear that one. In regard to the use of the, of the drugs, we know there's enough evidence now for us to be able, on the basis of this evidence, and using a certain amount of creative imagination, to foresee the kind of uses which could be made in a, uh, by people of bad will with these things, uh, and to attempt to to forestall this, and in the same way, I think with these other methods of uh, propaganda, we can foresee and we can do a good deal to forestall. I mean, after all, the, um, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. 
The price of freedom, my friends of the Savage Nation, is eternal vigilance. That's certainly not his original statement, but he saw what was coming. Not finally for the day, but finally for this segment. In, uh, I believe, in, in clip seven, he talks about drugs again. Let's hear, did we play seven? Yes. So let's go to number eight. I think this is a great one. Now, I, I think what, what is going to happen in the future is the dictators will find, as the old saying goes, that you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. That if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the ruled. And this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. Mm -hmm. They will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even. Mm -hmm. And so making him actually love his slavery. I mean, I think this is the danger, that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime, but they will be happy in situations where they oughtn't to be happy. You hear? Happy as slaves. Happy little slaves. All because of brainwashing and the use of drugs. Now, if you read Brave in the World in high school or college, which many of you uh, have read, you remember the society was being... Uh, created in laboratories. I, I love that when I first read it in high school. God, did it revolutionize my thinking. And uh, they would alter the embryo and the development of the embryo with outside influences, whether they be a chemical or through stimuli. And, and they could then create the uh, zygote that they wanted and it could emerge into the human that they wanted, whether it would be an alpha uh, human that would be born, meaning the highest level of intellect that would be running the society, or the beta, or the delta, or the gamma, uh, and the others. And it was amazing to read how he foresaw uh, the future of the world. Now, have we gotten to the alpha, beta, delta, and gamma? I think when you listen to some of the dumbest people in the history of the world in Congress, you have to say to yourself, how did so many uh, de deltas and gammas wind up in Congress. You have to ask yourself that question. The answer is, take a look at the districts they're in. They're largely non-English speaking, yes, I will say it, districts where the people do not even understand the language of the land. They are, uh, you take a, a occasional core Texas district in Queens, for example, 55% of it are illegal aliens who should never have been able to vote to begin with. Most of them do not read or speak English. They don't even know what the heck she is talking about. All they know is that she's young and she has two Hispanic last names, and so they vote for any of her crazy uh, statements. This is the danger that we are in. I'll be back in a moment. The Savage Nation. It's savage, uncut, unfiltered, and raw. Democracy depends on the individual voter making an intelligent and rational choice for what he regards as his enlightened self-interest in any given circumstance. But what these people are doing, I mean, what both for their particular purposes for selling goods and the dictatorial um, propagandists are doing, is to try to bypass the rational side of man and to appeal directly to these unconscious forces below the surface so that you are in a way making nonsense of the whole democratic procedure, which is based on conscious choice of, on rational ground. Aldous Huxley, 1958, interview by Mike Wallace, great interview, and he talked about technology, drugs, dictatorships, propaganda, and I spent so far on this show, uh, I reviewed the movie 1917, which I disliked, and I told you why. I read reviews from others that didn't like it, told you why. I read all the stories on michaelsavage.com, made comments, and then I read about Huxley, and there were no phone calls except one or two, and they were off topic. And I became frustrated, and I said to you, I believe that what's happening right now on this radio show is an example of exactly what's happening in our society. The Westwood One Podcast Network. <laughs>